All right, let's get started this morning. Let's open with a word of prayer. <clears throat> Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you thanking you this day for another day that you have set aside for us to worship you. We thank you that you have <clears throat> allowed us to live in a country where we're still free to gather for worship. Uh, there's so many people in the world that are not free. Even, even just north of our border in Canada, there's people that are not free to worship uh, as they would like. We just ask that you would protect that right from, for us. Uh, and if, if that right is taken away from us, Father, help us to uh, continue to worship you regardless, uh, because it is all about you. It is not about uh, earthly powers or, or anything else. It's, it's about you. Help us to remember that as we go through our, our, our days each day. Uh, help us to be worshipful and help us to put you first. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> okay. Uh, like I said, I like when it works. <laughs> ah, okay. Last week, we talked about the methodology of the church, and we talked about how the church uh, tries to become more secular to a, a appeal to the, to the world. Uh, <clears throat> and just just as, as a way to get us started, in what ways are local churches, and I said, not, not, not local to New Holland, but individual churches, uh, in what way are local churches tempted to lose focus of their purpose in their attempt to reach the culture? How do we, how do we uh, lose our focus on our purpose? Maybe not we, St. Stephen, but go ahead, John. A lot of churches go away from the Old Testament. New Testament would just be God loves you, God loves you, God loves you. Okay, yeah, that's true. They, they make a distinction between the Old Testament God and the New Testament God, and there is no distinction. Uh, you know, you think of God, some, some people consider the Old Testament, the God of the Old Testament to be a, a God of wrath. Uh, and uh, and uh, all you got to do is read Revelation, and you'll see that God is still a God of wrath, and and uh, and that's what we're that's what we're protected from because we believe in Him. We're protected from His wrath. Uh, how else? What else do we do? We 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 ignore the Old Testament sometimes. Okay, what else might a church do that to help appeal to the public? We ignore the uh, the message of salvation from. Okay. Yeah, we, we 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 forget about telling people that they're sinners and that they're going to hell if they don't repent and and accept Christ. And and we we become a uh, an extra special lions club or a social club of some sort, if you will, where we're doing a lot of good works. Uh, and 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 you publicize those good works which is nothing wrong with doing good works and publicizing that, but that's not the primary purpose of the church. Go ahead, Claire. Emphasis on entertainment instead, instead of, of preaching God's word. Gene. You're saying that's what happened to, to St. Stephen. Okay. Okay. Prior to, prior to Tim coming here is what you're saying, right? Right. Yep. Right. Okay, it went, 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 to, went towards entertainment, looking for ways to bring people in instead of preaching the gospel. Uh, and and, and that, that's, where, that's what led St. Stephen's uh, downhill. Yep, we had a, I, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to say another one. Uh, your money might be going in the wrong direction. Rather than the mission ministries, it's going to all the entertainment and 
Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That, for, for an individual to think about where, how's your money being spent? Is it being spent on missions? Is it being spent on spreading the gospel? Is it, spe- is it being built or, or spent on preaching the gospel? Or is it being spent on entertainment or building fancier buildings to bring the people in or, uh, you know, more, more, uh, that's a good question. That's a good thought to have. How's your, and that's where we're going to get into is the teaching of the church this week, but I wanted to, wanted to continue here. Uh, we had, go ahead, John. Yes. Don't preach the blood of Christ. Yeah. Yep. 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 It's not attractive. It's almost like sin is being ignored. Uh, everything is acceptable these days. And you keep going to church, we accept everything. Sin is being ignored. Yep. I think that's what Mike was saying too. Yep. 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 Because that's, we are, we're all sinners and we need to hear it. Uh, you know, we need, we need to know that, that, uh, that our lifestyle is, is, is not proper. Uh, when we still attended Bellevue, uh, Presbyterian church over in Gap, they started Gap community church over there, which was a charismatic, uh, a group. And, and, uh, our session, I was on session when that started and seemed to be really taking hold. People were going there and, Maybe we even had a member or two leave Bellevue and go to the Gap Community Church. And uh, we talked about what do we do? How do we combat this? And I said, we don't do anything. We just keep doing what we're doing. We preach the gospel. I said, as those people that are at Gap Community, as they begin to understand more about God, they're going to want theology. They're going to want something deeper. Not all of them. A lot of them are just going to want to stay surface. But there's going to be those that want deeper theology. So we're here for that. When 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 they when they say, well, somebody needs to explain this to me, we can do that. The Gap Community Church, I didn't think could do that. And uh, you know, I'm not sure where that that. But we never changed anything at Bellevue about our approach uh, in an in attempt to uh, to reach the people. We continued to preach the gospel, and that's that's what needs to happen. Well, I think- That's right. Yep. That, that's right. It's our responsibility to preach the gospel, not to increase our numbers. That's right. That's very true. Uh, we looked at a couple of, or the, the, the author here looked at a couple of quotes, extended quote from Charles Spurgeon. Uh, and I won't read it all, but he says, but just had three slides here, but say you, nobody talks so. Possibly they do not use the same words, but this is the real meaning of the, of the present day religion. The new plan is to assimilate the church to the world and so include a larger area where you're talking about numbers. That's a larger area uh, within its bounds by semi-dramatic performances. They make houses of prayer to approximate the theater. They turn their services into musical displays and their sermons into political addresses or, or philosophical essays. In fact, they exchange a temple for the theater and turn the ministers of God into actors who, whose business it is to amuse men. Uh, and Charles Spurgeon certainly was looking forward. I mean, he saw it in his day, but he was certainly looking forward to our day also. No, I don't. But he was he was he was eighteen hundreds, right? Charles Spurgeon. So isn't it amazing? <laughs> you know, just like just like God gave David insight, I think He gave Spurgeon insight into that one too. Uh, here's another quote from him. <clears throat> That very church which the world likes best is sure to be that which God abhors. Uh, (laughs) Let that sink in and think about that a little bit. Uh, Second Corinthians 6, 14 to 17 says, do not be bound together. This is usually talking about believers and an unbeliever, a believer and an unbeliever being married, but it goes way beyond that. Do not be bound together with unbelievers for what partnership have righteousness and lawlessness. Or what fellowship has light with darkness? Or what harmony has Christ with Satan? Or what has a believer in common with an unbeliever? Or what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God, just as God said, I will dwell in them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Therefore, come out from their midst and be separate, says the Lord. 
come out from their midst and be separate. That's our call that we're, we as Christians are supposed to be separate. Uh, and, and, and he has, he has made us holy. He has separated us. We need to learn to live that way. Okay. This week's lesson is on the teaching of the church. We talked about methodology last week, but this is on teaching. And here again, uh, uh, you know, teaching can really be watered down so that uh, you're not preaching the true gospel. Uh, Starting with a question, is the name of a church important? Okay. Okay. Okay, that's right. Uh, is it's kind of a leading question. What can you tell about our church from the name and by the logo? What can you tell about St. Stephen? It's reformed, okay? It says something. There's something there. There's some meat in that name. If you don't want to be reformed, don't bother coming. <laughs> well, or if you want to know more. Yeah about being reformed. Uh, the National Association of Evangelicals reports that 67% of churches in America have dropped their denominational names from the signage or advertising. Why might churches drop their denominational names? They don't want to offend anybody. Mike says they don't want to offend anybody. That, that's true. Okay, nations have gone so liberal that they they don't want to be associated with their with their umbrella organization anymore. Somebody else was saying, so. Jay. Okay. Yep. Bad connotations about a denomination. Oh, the Presbyterians are frozen chosen. I mean, I've heard that a lot. Uh, and uh, so, you know, is there anything wrong with dropping the denominational name? I mean, you look around, just look at churches around our area, and I could have done that, but just think of different churches that have no denominational name, like Petra. What other churches? Grace, okay. That used to be Grace Brethren, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, it seems to be trendy. Change that. I, I, I saw a couple different articles that I... I almost included stuff from there and there, but the different names of different churches like uh, uh, Redemption Church and different things like that where they don't acknowledge any kind of denominational uh, tie or anything, uh, trying to make it sound, they even dropped the word church out of their name. Uh, for the sake of growth and inclusivity, churches are afraid to define themselves and tell people what they believe. Doctrinal ambiguity has replaced the old confessions of faith and contemporary Christianity seems quite content to identify itself with only vague generalities. Uh, and uh, Ligonier does a, uh, a, every two years they do a, a report, a study with Lifeway Research and they ask the same questions uh, every, every two years and they look for uh, they look for the state of theology. Where, where, what do Christians believe? What does the general population believe? But what all does do Christians believe? And how's that changing over time? Uh, show a short video here, a couple minutes of Todd Friel from Wretched Radio talking about that, uh, that very uh, study. And then we'll look at some of the results of it. This is Wretched Radio with Todd Friel. <laughs> Nope, I'm not a doctor, and I don't play one on radio, but this is one sick patient. This is Wretched Radio, courtesy of Ligonier Ministries. Every two years, they take the time to survey American Christianity. That will be our patient today, the doctor, Ligonier Ministries. The results... I hold in my never-before-nicotine-stained fingers the state of theology. 
I guess we shouldn't be surprised that people are a bit confused when we have megachurch pastors saying Jesus never played the God card or Jesus never told us that we need to assemble every week. We see the state of the church as being very, very sick. Jesus was a great teacher, but not God. Uh Uh-oh. 52% agree with that. 36% disagree. That is a problem. Jesus wasn't just a good teacher. He was also God. Only God could teach that way. Why? Because Jesus even brought clearer and new teachings. When Jesus said, a new commandment I give to you, who gets to give commandments? God. Only God. What was he claiming? Deity. You've heard it said of old. Okay, here's the laws of Moses. Yep, that was said of old. That's um, uh, the God speaking through a prophet. I'm telling you, what do you think that was? That was a theological statement of his deity. Jesus was a great teacher who taught new commandments and is God. Not according to the majority of Americans. We're not really surprised. Are these proclaiming are Christians or just Americans? These are these are Americans. Here's the story. This is from Lifeway Research and Ligonier Ministries. They do this every year. This is according to this particular document from Ligonier itself. What do Americans think about Jesus Christ? And these are the results. So these are Americans, which claims to be predominantly Christian. Now, what about evangelicals? I believe the study gets into that in a bit, but frankly, it's not a whole lot better. It's not getting better when it comes to evangelicals understanding basic theology. We can't be teaching that cat 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 kiss 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 because people they won't like it and they won't come. So be it. If somebody doesn't desire to learn more about God, that should be a sign we probably have a more fundamental problem. If people don't want to memorize Bible verses, if they do not want to memorize the truths about God and his word, don't we have a little bit bigger problem than just amusing the masses? Catechism. It used to be standard fare. And you would have known the answer to these questions. Jesus was a great teacher, but not God. Oh, I've got it for you, Jimmy. Look at this. I got you. I got you covered. Thank you. Evangelicals. Go ahead. Yes. Americans, 52%. So evangelicals, you would expect it to be better. What do you think the percentages who agreed with Jesus was a great teacher, but not God? At least 75%. (laughs) That's the wrong direction, silly rabbit. I would say, honestly, I would say probably at least 25%. You're pretty warm. You win the prize and Mike showcase. 30% (laughs) agree. Wow. Now, these are evangelicals. Now, honestly... I'm not sure that we should be all that surprised when that is the case. Even the Apostle Paul said this when describing Who pushed Jesus that in, in his uh, letter to Philippians. I can't make it stop. He said, I'm like he the who Wizard was of Oz. with God did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. He who was made in the image of God did not. In other words, Jesus, this is amazing. Jesus never played the God card. He never said, okay, by the way, I'm God, right? You know? Are we really shocked that there's confusion about the deity of Jesus Christ? I don't know who that was, who the preacher was that said God, Jesus never claimed to be God. But uh, when he answered the question, I am, I mean, that pretty well clearly told everybody who he was. He was God. Uh, Just a little that this is the same question he was talking about was Jesus a great teacher. Oh, Jesus was a great teacher, but he was not God. Agree or disagree? Here's the results. The yellow is the general population, and the orange is evangelicals. Uh, well, that's at least better than the general population, but still 30% of evangelicals do not believe Jesus was God. Uh, that's kind of scary. Next question, and this goes kind of hand in hand. Jesus is the first and greatest being created by God. Agree or disagree? Disagree. Disagree. Yep, you're answering right. Well, look at the numbers. The general population says, I think it was 55, 54, 55. 
agree that that uh, he was the greatest. A higher percentage of evangelicals think Jesus was a created being. That's scary. We do have a fundamental problem. Uh, next question. God accepts worship of all religions. Agree or disagree? Disagree. Among evangelicals, 46% of people identifying as evangelicals in this study uh, agree with that statement that God accepts worship of all religions. We do have a fundamental problem, uh, and, and, and it's because the gospel, like Sue said, is, is not being taught anymore. Uh, why is it important to know what a church believes and or teaches before you join the congregation? Just because it's called a church, does it, is it going to preach the gospel? No, you're right. It's critical that you know. That's why we have new members, uh, uh, inquirers luncheons and so forth. We have, we have things like that so that people know what is, uh, what is being taught at the church and what the church believes. Uh, now, I had to put a little joke in there. Uh, too many times, these are some of the reasons why, uh, why people join churches or messages they're sending back to their pastor. Uh, please refer to sin as bad choices. Now, sin is sin, and you're going to hell because of it, unless you, unless you repent and accept Christ. Uh, tell me again how much God wants to bless me. You know, that's the health and wealth and prosperity gospel. Uh, okay, I'm going to go to the, uh, to the video of, of, uh, of this week's lesson now. If I can uh, new share. I didn't look into that. Uh, I, if I, I, I yes, I'm probably, I'm sure there probably is a criteria there if you dig down, but most people probably don't even read into that, uh, th what, what the criteria is. The, all I would say is that they self-identify as evangelicals. They call themselves evangelicals, just like a lot of America calls themselves Christians. Just like if you go to Greece, uh, they, they think they're a Christian nation. Uh, well, they all belong to the Greek Orthodox Church. Well, but what does that mean? Uh, what, what do you believe? Uh, you know, so you, that's a very good question. Just because you identify as an evangelical doesn't mean you believe the same thing that another person that identifies as evangelical uh, does. Evangelical used to mean, uh, you know, 15, 20 years ago that you were Bible believing uh, and, and so forth. But evangelical has has really changed its definition. You really can't use that uh, that term uh, in in a in a report like this, because you don't know what evangelical means. That's a very good point, Stu. Are you going to cooperate or not? Oh, yeah. The three marks of the church are unity, purity, and verity. And we need to remember that these three marks go together. In fact, you can't have the first two of unity and purity without the third one, verity. That is, truth is vital for the very existence of the church. The church doesn't exist without the truth. And this is why the church is called the pillar and ground of truth. Churches are to be a school, a place where we learn about God, learn about God's word, Teaching and preaching the Word of God is the fundamental purpose of the, of the church. The Great Commission is to go into all the world and make disciples. And part of making disciples is teaching. So if the church is not teaching and preaching and explaining this, the church is failing its main objective. The church shouldn't be hiding from what the Bible teaches but should be proud of what the Bible teaches, not ashamed of one 
jot or one tittle of the Word of God. But sadly, churches are now embarrassed about the Word of God, or they at least want to minimize it and put doctrine on the lower shelf or put doctrine in the attic where it's not about doctrine, it's about worshiping God. It's not about the truth. It's not about theology as much as it is about giving people a worship experience. But when churches put more on experiences than they do the Word of God, then the church is on a slippery slope away from pleasing the Lord, away into, I would believe, into liberalism. And, and once you start denying the Word of God or minimizing the Word of God, you cease to be pleasing God. And I think there are several reasons why churches no longer are proud of the truth, no longer are publishing to the world what they believe. We are seeing a day where churches no longer want to be identified as a Lutheran church or an Episcopal church or a Methodist church or a Baptist church or a Presbyterian church because that limits maybe who would attend the church. So we need churches that are more interdenominational or churches that are not going to limit who may attend. Thus, they're not willing to broadcast what they believe about baptism, broadcast what they believe about church polity, broadcast about what they believe about the Trinity or the nature of Jesus or even the doctrine of salvation. These important doctrines are being minimized. And I think there are several reasons for that. One, I think there's simply a lot of indifference today. Christians assume wrongly that all churches believe the same. And what determines what many Christians will decide on what church to choose is not what the church believes, not their confession of faith, but the programs they offer. Will my kid like this church? Will there's something to offer the college age students? That's what determines many cases why people choose this or that church. And part of it is that people are just don't care about theology. Uh, sadly, it's just something that's not a concern for a lot of, a lot of church-going people. They assume all churches believe the same, and that's okay. But what's important is other things. But this is just people not caring. But if there's one thing we all as Christians should care about, is the Word of God. We should care about important doctrines. We should care about the doctrine of God, the doctrine of man, the doctrine of salvation, the doctrine of the church should be very important for every Christian, not just for theologians, not just for the scholar, but every Christian should have a vital interest in the things of God and in the Word of God. But people just are not in, interested. It's indifference. But also there's this ignorance out there where people just assume that a confession of faith is not that important. You've heard this, people say, I have no creed but the Bible. I just believe the Bible. I don't need man's confessions. I don't need creeds. This sounds, in a way, it sounds wise and pious because I'm going to just believe this. This is my authority. And it is true. This is the only authority. The Bible, the Word of God, is the only authority we must believe even if we don't make sense to us or even if we don't understand it. We believe it because it's a divine authority. And every human document, we must not believe until we understand it. And not only that we understand it, but we're convinced that that document is a clear expression of the teaching of this authoritative book. But this idea that no creed but the Bible is a misunderstanding because every person has a creed. You have a belief. And either your belief is based upon the Word of God or it's a belief based upon your own opinion or someone else's opinion. You cannot not have an opinion about the doctrines of God. So either you're a good theologian or a poor theologian, but you are a theologian. The great Baptist B.H. Carroll said this, there never was a man in the world without a creed. What is a creed? A creed is what you believe. So you believe something, so you need to have a creed, a confession of statement, that is derived from this word. There's a third reason why churches are minimizing doctrine today. And I, I believe it's just merely pragmatism, being inclusive. We don't want to shut off anyone. 
And there's a sense that that's good. Everyone should be welcomed into the assembly of the saints. Uh, there's no discrimination when it comes to inviting people to the church. One advertisement I heard on the radio simply stated this, we as a church do not want to tell you what to believe. We want to help you find your best beliefs. Well, that's just pragmatic mysticism. That's just pragmatic uh, relativism. The Bible is authoritative. The Word of God is not worried about your feelings. It's not worried about uh, what you want to be true or what's your best beliefs. The Word of God is God's Word. And it's the commission of the church to properly, accurately, unashamedly proclaim it. And not just the doctrines that people want to hear, but the whole council. Proclaim the glories of heaven and also proclaim the, the woes and the dangers and the scariness of hell. We must proclaim the whole counsel of God. But I believe the biggest reason churches are minimizing doctrine today it's not just for pragmatic reasons, not just for ignorance and indifference, but I think there's a rise in mysticism. Mysticism is seeking to find God independent of the truth. That is, seeking to have an experience without backing up the experience from God's Word. The nature of mysticism is an idea of an experience without truth, but it has three basic beliefs. One, that God is ineffable, that you cannot know God. And because you can't know God, you can only experience Him. And that experience is incommunicable. That is, once you experience God, there's no way to tell others about that experience. There is some truth to this in Christianity. However, when you divorce truth from the experience, then you're opening yourself up to all kinds of dangers. People love to worship God. Now that sounds strange when people who are lost and unconverted hate God. But just because people in their natural state do not love God, doesn't mean they don't love to worship God because we are all worshipers. We're going to worship something. And looking at the human race, it's easy to see that the world is full of God worshipers. And these worshipers, if they would be Muslims, if they would be Buddhists, they're sincere. They're sincerely earnest in their worship of their deity. In America and throughout the Christian world, even Christians who don't know the Lord, in Christians in name only, they want to worship God. People want to worship God. But are they worshiping the living God? And you can give unbelieving, professing Christians an experience through music, through setting the stage, and they can feel like they've encountered the living God through a worship service. I remember being in such worship services when I was younger, uh, being amazed about how powerful the Spirit is in this place. And I remember thinking about my hair coming, standing up on my arms and thinking, man, the Spirit is strong. It's almost like electricity in this room. Until I went to a sporting event and they played the national anthem. And with such pride in my heart for the nation that I'm a part of, the same experience happened to me. And I'm going, wait a minute, is this the Holy Spirit? See, emotions can create a worship experience, but it doesn't mean it's of the Lord. Mysticism is easy to produce, but we have to root our emotions, our feelings in something objective, something concrete. Of course, true Christians are gonna experience God and it's gonna be a heartfelt experience, full of love, full of joy. In fact, it'll be a joy unexpressible and full of glory. No doubt about Christianity being real and personal, uh, but everything that we experience has to be backed up with truth. Why am I so enamored with Jesus Christ? It's not because I said, Jesus, I loved you 20 times in a song. It's because I meditate upon what Christ has done for me on the cross, thinking about, the righteous dying in my place. Now that will bring emotion and a, a, a spirit of, of feeling close to the presence of God. But I can tell you why I feel what I feel. See, sound doctrine will lead to sound worship. Deep truth will lead to deep worship. 
but shallow doctrine will only lead to a mystical experience that can be reproduced by just crafting the right experience for people. Every church is responsible to confess what it believes and what it teaches. If a church won't be upfront with you, you need to look for another church. If it says join us, then learn what we teach, what we will preach, then I would be scared of a church of that nature. And this is why confessions of faith are so important. There's two basic reasons we need confessions of faith and statements of what we believe. First of all, is because of error. Now it'd be simple enough if everybody believed the same and if there was no heresies or doctrinal error, if there was no such thing as misunderstanding the Word of God, then we could all say, I believe the Bible. The Bible is my confession of faith. Then everybody would say, yes, that's my confession of faith too. That's what I believe too. But we have Mormons. We have Jehovah Witnesses. We have all kinds of false teachers claiming to believe the Bible. And you say, well, we may need a little more clarification than just I believe the Bible. We need a basic confession like I believe in the gospel. But that too has a lot of misunderstandings. A lot of people say, I believe in the gospel. Even today, the word evangelical doesn't mean anything. You say, well, I'm an evangelical Christian. Well, there's a lot of evangelical Christians out there that claim that, that don't believe in regeneration of the Holy Spirit, don't believe in imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ, don't believe in the inspiration of the, of the Holy Scriptures. See, because of error, it's important that the church clarifies its teaching. James Bannerman puts it this way, Confessions of faith would not have been needed if there was no error. And because there are errors and heresies, the church needs to be willing to confess what it believes. The second reason churches need confessions of faith is because the church is commanded to teach the whole counsel of God. It is sad that churches intentionally minimize doctrine. But when they do this, when they elevate the singing to the point where it's dominant and minimize the preaching to 10 to 15 minutes and in that sermon it's not much theology at all but how man can help himself. When it becomes real shallow teaching, the church is failing in its most important responsibility. Because churches are not preaching the truth anymore or minimizing theology and doctrine, there's a huge amount of ignorance in the pew. It's sad, the amount of ignorance that lies in many, many evangelical churches today. There's been a recent study commissioned by Ligonier Ministries in 2018 that says that 70% of professing evangelicals think that Jesus Christ was the first created being of God. Now that's heresy. But that's a large amount of professing evangelicals. 70% don't even know that Jesus is God. This is very sad indeed. 56% think the Holy Spirit is just a force and not a personal being. 50% thinks God accepts pagan worship from other religions. I mean, this is people in the pews. I once saw a study where person went into church after church and after the services interviewing the members. And only one out of a hundred people essentially was able to explain the doctrine of justification by faith alone. What would Martin Luther think of that? The core of the gospel, the most important doctrine that Luther says is in the Bible, that we're justified not by works, but by faith in the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ. This is essential to the gospel. You get this wrong, you've got salvation wrong. You've got the gospel wrong, and it's a soul damning heresy. We have to know these things. And only one out of 100 people could answer that question. When I saw that study, I, I made a commitment to myself that I must teach the Word of God so the people who I'm responsible in shepherding and discipling know the truth. Churches must be committed to teaching their people. And this is what happened to Martin Luther. Martin Luther, who was born in 1483 in the house that's right behind me. As the story goes, he would go on to become a monk, then from there to start a reformation in 1517. 
But after the Reformation, he went and traveled the area of Germany looking at the churches. After visiting the churches, he writes, I have been compelled to write this catechism in this simple form by lamentable deficiency in the means of instructions which I witnessed lately in my visitation. God help us. What deplorable things I have seen. The common people wholly without any knowledge of doctrine. I think Luther would discover the same thing in our day. And churches are responsible for this. The church who's called to be the pillar and ground of truth, the ambassadors of God, ones who are responsible to proclaim the whole council are failing to do what they're called to do. Well, Luther says it's not just the members, but it's even the pastors that he found that were ignorant of basic Christian truths. Thus, he wrote these two catechisms to help solve this problem. And I think today churches need to reevaluate their purpose. We may not need another program as much as we need to get back to the main objective the church is called to carry out. The pulpit ministry, the teaching ministry of the church is paramount. If we fail in this area, we failed as a church. Well, there's a third reason that churches need confessions of faith. And I would even say robust confessions of faith. And that's because every Christian has the right to know what church he's entering into. That should be the most important question you ask about a church. So what should I look for in a church? You should look for a church with sound theology, sound doctrine. You should look for a church that puts a high priority on preaching and teaching the Word of God. You see, every church member or potential church member has the right to know what the church believes or how the church will interpret the scriptures. With all the false teaching that's prevalent in churches today, it's not sufficient just to say we love Jesus. The question is, what Jesus do you love? Who is this Jesus that causes you to love him so much? Is he the Jesus of the Bible? Well, to know if he's the Jesus of the Bible, you have to know the Bible. You have to know who this Christ is. And therefore, confessions are important because it, it stating what the church believes, and that is simply stating how the church interprets the scriptures. So I don't need to know that you believe the Bible. I need to know how you interpret the Bible. And by hearing how you interpret the Bible, that's how I know what you believe. James Betterman writes about this. He says, the language of scripture is best language to express God's mind, but it's not the best language to express the mind of the church. And that's important to understand the distinction. The word of God is infallible. Nothing needs to be changed. But this very word is interpreted differently by different churches and different ministers. And so I wanna know as a potential member of the church, how the ministers, how the church interprets the word justification. Just to say I believe in justification is not sufficient because many people put different definitions to that biblical term. So we need extra biblical language of explanation of what does the Bible actually teach about justification. And this is why confessions of faith, especially those historical proven confessions of faith are so important for the church. So we can look, this is what the church believes about the deity of Jesus Christ about the inspiration of scriptures, about the gospel, about justification and sanctification and glorification. All these things are vital because in the end, it's the truth that saves. It's the truth that sanctifies. It's the truth that glorifies God and it's the truth that, that edifies man. If we're not about the truth, if the church minimizes the truth, it's failing in its main objective. This is why churches do not need to be ashamed of a robust confession of faith. Uh, Stu, to answer your question, they, I did a little research on the, on the, uh, on the Ligonier State of Theology. 
people were asked the question, do you identify as evangelical, black Protestant, mainline, Roman Catholic, or other? So they got to pick. That's, they, they picked themselves. I tried to take the survey, but it didn't tell me, you know, how do you identify yourself as an evangelical or, or it didn't give definitions. It may somewhere, but uh, I didn't find them, but you got to pick, which I thought was kind of interesting. Evangelical, they separated evangelical and main line out. I mean, uh, Presbyterian would be considered a main line church, I think, wouldn't it? Uh, just, you know, so, uh, so people were asked to identify as evangelical or, or main line or Roman Catholic. Uh, So I think that kind of gets any, any uh, <laughs> what did I do? Any comments, uh, any comments on what you heard there? Jeffrey Johnson, his name is. He's, uh, he, he, he has a, a small church, but he's associated with the Puritan Reformed Seminary. Uh, I mean, and, and that's that's who publishes this this material. So, <clears throat> all right, let's close in prayer. <clears throat> Father, we just thank you for your word. We thank you that uh, that uh, that you have given us your word to to read and to study and to learn from. Uh, however, we we are also thankful, Father, for for many great men that you have given wisdom and insight into. Uh, into writing these great confessions like the Westminster Confession and all the other confessions that help us to, uh, to pull from all parts of the Bible to build a theology. Uh, and, and there's always footnotes there to tell us which verses they've used to determine that. We thank you that uh, you, have, you have not only given us your word, but you have given us great interpreters and, and, and preachers to uh, exposit that word. We just asked if you would help uh, us to, uh, to look for, uh, for good, sound expositors to get our teaching from and we and we thank you that we have that here at saint stephen and we uh, we look forward to uh pastor drew coming and doing the same thing in the future uh, again father we just thank you for all that you have given us and and all the resources that you have given us to be able to dig deep into your word father help uh help uh, that we ask that you would give us your holy spirit to lead us into truth in jesus name we pray amen